Hello, and welcome to the third and final video on my paper, Social Media in the Public Sphere. So we've already covered the importance of modern social media, the development of European print culture, Renaissance, Reformation, and institutions of control, the printing regimes in Holland and England, uh, the scientific revolution, and 17th century debates on economic questions. And now we'll move on to talk about political movements in the English-speaking world, and I'll make some concluding comments. So political movements in the English-speaking world. In 17th century Europe, the public discussion of even scientific and economic ideas was innovative and generally to conservatives challenging and in some instances suppressed. But open discussion of political and religious issues was far more radical and problematic. As I've noted above, divisions within both the Dutch and the English elites allowed such discussions to take place, and they represent an essential part of the development of more open societies in these two states. In England, however, moves towards greater openness were strongly contested, and political and religious revolution ensued. Although England and Holland shared many characteristics during the early modern period, including relatively free printing regimes and the increasing importance of mercantile capitalism in their societies, England, Great Britain as it became from 1707 onwards, became increasingly distinctive in its political system compared with its European neighbours. First, with a bloody civil war from 1642 to 51, and a period in which the monarchy itself was formally abolished from 1649 to 60. Second, and overlapping with the civil war period, the increasing importance of parliament, and later the emergence of a two-party political division. And third, the glorious revolution of 1688-89, and the establishment of a constitutional monarchy, and the legal adoption of a Bill of Rights. Every aspect of these political developments and disputes was reflected in and often aided by print media, the most important of which in terms of general impact were generally pamphlets and prints, the precursors of modern cartoons. Major contestations for power were accompanied by the widespread production and distribution of printed materials which sought to gain the support of the wider public, particularly in London. Several major books were also influential, including the works by Milton and Hobbes mentioned in the previous video. Later works, including John Locke's two treaties of government in, published in 1689, written at an earlier date but published just after the Glorious Revolution, for which it seemed to offer legitimacy and later taken up as a justificatory text by the American patriots in what became their war of independence against Britain. As in the case of the earlier Reformation, the Civil War period in particular saw the emergence of radical political and religious groups such as the Levellers and the Quakers, their messages again disseminated in print. Uh, all of these subjects obviously require more detailed treatment than I can give them here, and hopefully I may be able to cover them in future videos. For the moment, uh, note only that this period culminated in the Glorious Revolution uh, and the establishment of constitutional monarchy and the Bill of Rights in England and the rapid rise uh, to fame of the philosopher John Locke, whose works included the de facto legitimation of the revolution and the concept of individual rights. I have, by the way, made a brief double video about Locke uh, earlier on and details which I'll give below. On the basis of the material reviewed in this paper, it's possible to make a number of observations, some of which have wider relevance to the impact of social media in general. First, like modern social media, printing could play an important role in creating autonomous communication networks and so contribute powerfully to processes of social and political change. As noted, the rapid diffusion of printing across Western Europe and the large numbers of relatively cheap books and other materials that were soon being produced impacted the spread of literacy, the diffusion and popularization of ideas, and textual scholarship. 
it also strengthened the development of Renaissance humanism and the Reformation critique of the religious establishment and facilitated the spread of the ideas of the scientific revolution and of the political, religious and economic debates of 17th century England. Second, printing did not play an inevitable and overwhelming role in such change. Like modern social media, it could facilitate social action, but did not by itself ensure its success. Printing technology was rapidly diffused across the whole of Western, that is initially Catholic Europe, but the printing regimes that emerged in different states were very different from each other. Then, as now, other contributory and causal factors were involved, and the specific political, religious, and social contexts of particular states at particular times must be brought into consideration. The spread of Protestantism in certain countries certainly was aided by printing, but its success was primarily decided by the conversion of powerful elites rather than the impact of printing. The emergence of trans-European networks of scientists was crucially reinforced by the distribution of books and journals, but relied on the institutionalization of webs of correspondence through the formation of scientific societies for their success. Late 17th century London coffee shops provided a physical space for discussion and so played a major role in enabling economic and political debate. But those debates went beyond anything that the coffee shops provided. Three, uh, one variable of particular importance in discussing both the spread and impact of printing is what Jürgen Habermas has called the public sphere. Societies in which relatively free printing regimes emerged were those in which public debate and the development of a public sphere became possible, whilst those in which printing regimes were restricted were also those in which public debate was limited or prevented. The freedom to print and the freedom to discuss issues of public importance were related and were seen to be related as printing came to be seen as potentially disruptive of established order. The emergence of the public sphere could be contested, as it was in England, or reversed, as it was in Venice. Fourthly, in this regard, states varied greatly both in the degree of social freedom which they permitted, as well as in their willingness and ability to control printing. More liberal states came to allow more freedom of expression, but even authoritarian governments, which saw unrestricted printing as a threat to their power, varied in their effectiveness in suppressing dissenting voices and the discussion of sensitive issues. Spain and Portugal, for example, were far more effective in restricting the distribution of printed materials within their territories than was France. Similar observations can doubtless be made about modern state reactions to social media. Fifth, even when printing played a major role in affecting political or social change, subsequent events could be out of the control or influence of those originally involved in producing and distributing printed material or inspired by it. Thus, the Reformation was a complex and multifaceted movement which included many contradictory elements, some of which would have horrified the first generation of reformers who had used printing so successfully to disseminate their message, which was then appropriated by others for their own purposes. Similarly, the English Civil War period centred on the religio-political conflict between factions of the elite, but also produced a plethora of religious and political groups who made a more fundamental challenge to the whole established order. Six, suppression had a massive impact, but it was never entirely effective. Controls could be circumvented, not just by illegal printing, but by smuggling forbidden books in from elsewhere. In a multi-state system, such as early modern Europe, it was probably inevitable that suppression would never be universally effective. Again, where suppression was effective, it was likely to have negative consequences, as when the exclusion of challenging books could cut our society off from knowledge of scientific advances, as in Spain. There were also the largely unknown consequences of self-censorship. 
a few specific instances are known, as with the philosopher's De philosopher Descartes' decision not to publish some of his scientific work because of the hostility and threats shown towards the astronomer Galileo for his public support for the heliocentric view of the cosmos, but many other instances may remain undiscovered, examples of the potentially disruptive and destructive force of censoring creativity and original thought. In conclusion, I would assert that whilst the past is never the same as the present, it commonly provides a world of comparison and study which may help us to better understand the present. The rise and impact of European print media are of major importance and interest to historians, but they're also of relevance to those who want to better understand the role and impact of modern social media. So many thanks to my patrons, and thank you for listening to these three videos. Um, if you would like to support my channel, you're very welcome to like uh, the videos, comment on them, share them with your friends, uh, and subscribe if you want to be notified of future videos. If you want to support the development of the channel, you can do so through either Patreon or PayPal. I'll give the links uh, below. Uh, so have a good day. Oh, um, and uh, next uh, week we'll move on to talk about medieval thought.